Human space flight is in a crisis situation. As many of us probably know, the deorbiting of the International Space Station is unlikely to take place in 2032. It's only funded through 2030, and according to people like Elon Musk, the station is deteriorating so fast that by 2027, it will no longer be safe and should be deorbited by then. Now, NASA's original plan to deal with this situation was to contract independent private organizations to put their own space stations in low Earth orbit, and then to contract out these stations for whatever work they'd like to have done in a microgravity laboratory. However, as time has gone on, private funding for these space stations has been hard to come by, and NASA, facing very deep budget cuts right now, is un likely to be able to pick up the tab, meaning that by 2028 or so, we could be facing a situation where China controls the only viable microgravity laboratory in low Earth orbit. And this is a very, very grim thing because we're talking about unique pharmaceuticals, unique rare metals, and also 3D printing of organs. All of these things cannot be conducted in environments other than low Earth orbit, meaning that China will control all of these bleeding edge industries on top of all of the industries that they already control. There is one possible hope right now, one space station that has passed its preliminary design review and recently received a big infusion of cash along with other major milestones, but it still has a long ways to go. It is a combined endeavor between Voyager and Airbus, the first ever space station to have a European company as its primary founding member, and its name is Star Lab. Good afternoon, space flight enthusiasts, and once again, welcome to the Angry Astronaut. So, a very pressing issue that's facing us right now, and by us, I mean the Western world when it comes to access to low Earth orbit and therefore access to microgravity laboratory environments is the fact that the International Space Station may not make it until 2030. Certainly seems very unlikely to last any longer than 2030. And that creates a bit of a crisis situation because the entire goal was to have private industries take over this very important responsibility, and that is maintaining a permanent presence in low Earth orbit and therefore a permanent access to microgravity research environments. And that's something that very possibly may end up exclusively in the hands of the Chinese or perhaps the Indians, depending on when they can get their space station up, if these private industries are not equal to the task. And right now, none of these organizations seem very likely to get their space stations in orbit in the time frame that they've been talking about. Sierra Space Space and Blue Origin had their combined plan, the Orbital Reef Station, perhaps one of the most exciting and ambitious plans. So far, we haven't seen a whole lot about that aside from Sierra Space's experiments with their inflatable modules, which are very impressive, but we still haven't seen a single test article ready to send to orbit. And then we have VAST, which was never part of NASA's private industry space station plans, but they managed to elbow their way into the space with the help of a lot of private investment, and they seem very likely to deploy at least a single module that is human rated here in the next couple of years. But in terms of deploying an ambitious space station by 2030, that may be very difficult as well. And then one of the most promising space station plans, one of the easiest and most straightforward plans for putting a station in orbit is what used to be just Voyager, what is used to be known as NanoRacks, 
and other major legacy companies in the United States collaborating on a program called Star Lab. However, the vast majority of those legacy companies have pulled out and have been replaced by Airbus. This is now becoming a majority European space station. And because it's starting to head that way, also there's a lot of diversity with the nations that are being asked to collaborate on this ranging from a much greater European involvement to even the involvement of countries like India. So the good news is, well, there's a couple of pieces of good news about this station. Number one, you can deploy it in a single launch. At the same time, it's also surpassed a number of major milestones in recent months that we're going to be covering in this video. But the bad news is it still has a long ways to go and also... This station cannot be deployed by anything except Starship. Only a vehicle with Starship's fairing size is going to be able to deploy this station in a single launch. And the big question is, is Starship going to be ready to deploy payloads of this magnitude by the time the ISS is deorbited in 2030? First of all, let's learn about the partners involved in this collaborative effort. They are pretty impressive and have lots of heritage behind them. First of all, there's Voyager Space, which is a leader in space commercialization, a global commercial space leader with 35 plus years of spaceflight heritage and 1300 plus missions flown from 35 plus countries, mostly in regards to various components that are flown on the space station, like NASA equipment manufacturing and the International Space Station Bishop Airlock, and also satellite deployment and scientific research from the International Space Station, and finally, commercial mission control operations. Now, Voyager is the leader of Star Lab's joint venture and has been awarded $217 plus million through NASA to develop a replacement to the ISS. And then Airbus is the second major partner. Airbus, of course, being the largest space company in Europe and has decades of proven flight heritage, technology development, and manufacturing expertise for human spaceflight. Airbus is responsible for the automated transfer vehicle which resupplied the International Space Station for the European Space Agency along with the European Service Module for the SLS and the Bartolomeo Program for the ISS and finally the ISS Columbus Module also for the European Space Agency. Airbus is manufacturing the primary habitation module for the Star Lab Space Station it's 8 meters in diameter and it can only be deployed by Starship or possibly by SLS. SLS has a large enough fairing for it also, but I don't think anybody would want to spend that kind of money to deploy a single module. Now, Mitsubishi is also contributing to the project along with MDA Space, which is a global leader in space robotics, which has over 55 years of experience on 450 plus missions. MDA Space will equip Star Lab with its full range of external robotics, including the scalable and modular MDA SkyMaker. And as you can see, the SkyMaker is sort of an improved Canadarm with a longer reach and with greater versatility than the Canadarm. And then you have another company called Palantir, which is making Star Lab an AI-enabled space station. A leader in AI and machine technology, Palantir will enable real-time decisive intelligence and decision-making from ground to Star Lab. And then, interestingly, Hilton Hotels, a leader in global hospitality, is bringing its world-class design expertise to help reimagine the human experience in space because it matters where you stay. So maybe it's going to be a lot more comfortable on this space station than on the ISS. I suppose time will tell. 
And the final contributing partners are Northrop Grumman and The Ohio State University in bringing their own field of space expertise to this space station. So lots of collaborators on this ambitious station. But as I said, this thing can be deployed in a single launch. It has its own power supply, its own maneuvering system, its own propulsion and power system, and of course, this massive habitation unit as well. So here's the recent developments with this station, and the first comes from NASA.gov. Quote, a NASA-funded commercial space station, Starlab, recently completed four key developmental milestones, making substantial progress in the station's design and operational readiness. The four milestones are part of a NASA Space Act agreement awarded in 2021 and focused on reviews of the habitat, structural test article preliminary design, systems integration, integrated operations, and a habitat structural test plan. Quote, these milestone achievements are great indicators to reflect Star Lab's commitment to the continued efforts and advancements of their commercial destination, said Angela Hart, program manager for NASA's commercial low earth orbit development program. As we look forward to the future of low earth orbits, every successful milestone is one step closer to creating a dynamic and robust commercialized low earth orbit. The commercial space station is designed to launch on a single flight and includes a large habitation and laboratory module with a smaller service module for power and propulsion. Earlier this year, Star Lab Space completed a structural test article preliminary design review supported by NASA, and this test article is an engineering development unit of the station's habitation module, whereas where the astronauts will spend most of their time living and working aboard the future commercial destination. An engineering development unit is a physical model that is used to test and verify the design of a project such as a space station. Starlab also recently shared a test plan for the structural test article which included defining qualification tests of the development unit from welding verifications to proof pressure and static load testing amongst others. During proof pressure tests, a spacecraft component or system is pressurized to a significantly higher than normal operating pressure to verify its structural integrity, and a static load test measures the response of a component or system under an applied load. In addition, Star Lab completed integration operations and systems integration reviews. These reviews included updates on system and station architecture, segment interfaces, and program goals, as well well as a comprehensive look into the program's requirements. Star Lab is also set to complete a preliminary design review and phase one safety review by the end of the year. This review is meant to demonstrate that the station's design meets system requirements, including human spaceflight verification with acceptable risk. The safety review will summarize the current design and general safety approach for the destination. NASA is supporting the design and development of multiple commercial space stations, including Star Lab, through funded and unfunded agreements. The current design and development phase will be followed by the procurement of services from one or more companies, where NASA aims to be one of many customers for low Earth orbit destinations. Now, aside from this good news, Voyager Technologies had some very good news on the financial side because they opened up their IPO on June 11th, and their shares increased by 82%. 2.2% by the end of the first day of trading. The company raised $383 million in the IPO, sharing 12.35 million shares at $31 each. The company had a market cap of more than $3 billion at the close of the day. This, therefore, is a unicorn company in a big way. Voyager said that it would use the funding in part for various strategic projects. This, of course, includes Star Lab, and the IPO is a way to show NASA that Voyager has an incredibly strong and healthy balance sheet. This is according to Matthew Kuta, president of Voyager. And of course, Airbus has a pretty healthy balance sheet as well, meaning that there's a very good chance, in my opinion, 
opinion of this space station becoming the anointed successor to the ISS as far as NASA is concerned. Not that NASA has a lot of money to spend on these kinds of things right now, because, as we all know, NASA's funding has been cut by 25%, and even though human spaceflight has received a modest increase in funding, none of that is dedicated towards low Earth orbit flight. Instead, that's all about the Moon and Mars, meaning that even if this does become the successor to the ISS, they're going to have to take care of the vast majority of the funding themselves, which even Voyager may not be able to accomplish, given that the cost of this space station is likely to range between $2.8 and $3.3 billion. But as I have emphasized many times now, if the United States allows the ISS to be deorbited before they have a viable commercial successor, then all of these critical bleeding edge technologies and sciences is going to pass exclusively over to the People's Republic of China. And how many of us really want to see that happen? Thanks for watching and now stay tuned for an update about my upcoming journey to Australia and New Zealand. So once again, let me give you guys a quick update on the whole Australia situation. Didn't expect that I'd be updating folks this regularly, but so many things have been happening on a regular basis. Yesterday, I uh, notified the fans of Australian space flight anyway as to the most recent developments, but not a lot of people watch that video. So I just want to make sure everybody knows about what's happened. In such a short amount of time, we've had 28 contributors bring us up to 35 percent of our final goal, which has allowed me to reserve my flight to Australia on September 11th. And as, as I said before, I'm going to be there for five weeks, not leaving until the third week of October. Thank you so much for your support. We still have a ways to go, obviously another 65% of the way to go to hit the final goal to fund this trip. So if you'd like to see me go to Australia, if you'd like to see this unique content and lots and lots of videos being made during my visit there about all of this unique technology that's being developed in this region of the world, well, all you have to do is go to the description. My GoFundMe is there, or you can become a Patreon supporter or purchase a piece of merchandise. That's enough of that. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time, stay angry about space.